Ooh, that's a weaker one. I rate that one is a one. <laughs> Top. Uh, What's that? Sham. What's that? Is that sham? Yeah. Sham treatment, so nothing on those strips. Folks, Phil Beeman here. I have Sarah and Alvaro here today, who are the folks behind this Saskatchewan project that I've been involved in for over a year now. Uh, let's start by you guys telling us who you are and a bit about how you got into bees. Well, hi everyone. I am Alvaro, and I am from Mexico. I did my education there as a DBM, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. Then I also did my masters focusing on honeybees. And after that, I did my PhD at the University of Well in Ontario. And now I am a postdoc a fellow at Sarah Woods Lab in the University of Saskatchewan. Great. And I'm Sarah. I am a faculty member in the Department of Veterinary Pathology at the University of Saskatchewan. And I hold a research chair in pollinator health. And I got into bees completely by accident, as you do. Um, I was a veterinarian and I was looking for a research project and none of the other projects really stood out to me, but I met this uh, one faculty member who told me that um, he'd never done research in bees and he had no money. And so I thought, that sounds like a great project. <laughs> and so um, with uh, my supervisor, Elmer Simcoe, um, I did I ended up doing a PhD looking at um, neonicotinoids and their effects on honeybees in Western Canada and um, grew from there and now um, I have the pleasure of leading a lab doing research here in Saskatchewan and, and across the prairies. Awesome. So we've just come out of a long day of uh, winding up the second year of trials on these oxalic strips. So if anyone sees a bee fly out of our shirt collar, oh, there's one now. Oh, and another one. Oh, okay. So th this is the real deal, folks. Um, but maybe uh, let's s explain what we did today. And then uh, we'll talk about results from previously after. So what did we just do? Go ahead. Uh, well, for today's experiment, we, we are just finishing the experiment. Uh, the, we exposed bees to the new formulation of oxalic acid glycerin strips. It's called Varoxan. And we wanted to test this experiment during the winter because it's the time of the year where most of the mites are on the adult bees because usually there is not brood in the, in the hive. So we wanted to test this, uh, this uh, product in three different doses. So this is the second year that we repeated that. And today we just remove the strips, assess cluster size. Well, first the, e the effect of the strips on the mites and the effect of the bees, on the effect of the strips on the bees. So the effect on the strips on the mites, we assess the mite infestation levels in adult bees and also we use sticky boards that were placed on their uh, screen bottom board to assess how many mites were killed by this product. And the effect of those strips on the uh, bees whereby, well, we assess cluster size, how big or how many frames are covered by bees. The first year we assess the temperature in the colony and also the so survivorship after the, uh, the strips were in place. Okay, and actually the colonies look not too bad, right? So uh, the first time we put the strips in, in the start of 2025 in January, and they came out at the sort of end of the wintering season, 
This year, we modified the protocol and put the strips in just before the bees went into winter. And so now it's uh, ending now. Uh, do we expect that to have any difference? We'll see. Okay. I, um, I think it's probably, like you mentioned, more practical for beekeepers to be inserting the strips late in the fall and removing them now rather than inserting them now in midwinter. Um, but I think uh, just in general, we, you know, from late fall to spring, you know, that's a treatment window and, and whatever part of that we want to target, um, you know, we're going to vary. Um, in, in general, that's sort of a research theme of our lab is, is can we design practical <clears throat> miticide treatment strategies for the overwintering period? And um, with these strips, we've sort of targeted two different insertion times which would be most effective and then also most practical. So can we talk about what we learned from the first trial? What did you get? Okay, well, something that we didn't mention was that this experiment is taking place in two provinces, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and in three different locations, in Manitoba here with Phil, and two locations in Saskatchewan. In, from the experiment that we have or the result that we found here. We have learned that, of course, these oxalic acid in these certain strips reduce the mite infestation levels in, on adult bees. Uh, also, something to mention is that we, our experimental groups were five. So we have a negative control, which was a sham. Uh, we used the same strips, cardboard uh, strips, without any chemical, so it was negative control. As a positive control, we use amitrals, excuse me, and then three different doses of oxalic acid, low, um, medium, and high dose. For low dose, one strip. Okay, so the sham strip has exact, so if there's risk to the bees of inserting the strip, and or it's causing some harm or whatever, that's factored out by the fact that we're testing one group of hives mm -hmm. with just a cardboard strip. Yep. The amitraz is the gold standard treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Which may not be perfect anymore. We know that there's a potential for some resistance, but it's useful benchmark to know how that works under the same conditions. And then these strips were coated with glycerin oxalic mix uh, provided by the manufacturer and then that is the active ingredient we're actually trying to figure out uh, what uh, whether it works at all in these conditions but also maybe what the right dose is right because mm -hmm. you have different levels of dose okay so so there's actually like five treatment groups yes five yeah. treatment groups yes okay so low medium high strips yes. and the high was how many four strips per we use a single brood chamber for this strip. Yeah. And then the low dose was one strip? One. And then the medium dose two. was two. Okay, so we almost should have had like a medium medium or something, but mm -hmm. we'll, uh, okay, so uh, keep going. You're doing great. So for the parameters that we, or the variables that we measure, first was how the bees, or the, if the bees avoid the strips. And we found that with the high dose, bees tend to avoid the strips uh, significantly compared to other groups. Then for the mite infestation levels, we found that all colonies that receive any treatment against Varroa have or reduced the mite infestation levels below 1%, which is now the threshold that is being suggested. Uh, also the mite, the number of mites that are found on the sticky boards were lower, sorry, were higher. So the treatments, all the treatments kill more mites. So we found more mites uh, on the sticky boards. Then we measure uh, for the cluster size, the treatment with the highest population, the more number of frames or the highest number of frames covered by bees was a uh, low dose of oxalic acid, only one strip. And when we measure the temperature, that treatment had also the highest 
uh, temperature, which makes sense. Highest uh, or bigger the cluster size, higher the temperature. Uh, we also assess the other uh, variables, nosema levels, and we didn't find any difference. And one of the reasons that we wanted to measure nosema was because we observed that when we were counting the sticky words, there were so many faces kind of dysentery from the, from the bees. Yeah. But we didn't see any significant difference. And in terms of mortality, we observed that high, high dose was significant different from control, which means that higher number, less or higher colonies uh, didn't survive during the winter and by the spring with a high dose of oxalic acid. So let me make sure I get that straight. So you have colonies that have higher mite levels or higher dose. Higher dose, sorry. Higher, higher so dose. the high dose oxalic had higher mortality. Correct. And so you can, seems then that we know you can overdose, yes. essentially, right? Yes. So that's important to know. Um, and then we would uh, then try to find out, uh, but it did also control mites, right? Correct. Right. So you can kill lots of mites, but you want to make sure you don't kill your bees. This is the, the struggle we're all in. So um, then, uh, so what uh, advice do you have for beekeepers about using these strips uh, under the conditions that we're doing so far. Do you have any, any, any particular recommendations you're prepared to make or do you want to wait until we get the data from this year before you want to commit yourself? Well, something important to mention is that this product was just recently available to Canada and the label is uh, on the registration. So my advice at the first or at the beginning is to follow the label. And the recommendation from the company is to use them uh, in the summer, or well, in the, mm -hmm. not in the winter. Uh, however, with these results, after we analyze all the data from the different uh, locations and put all the data together from the two years that this experiment is taking place, uh, we can make a conclusion. But I think we, we can say from our first winter that um, miticide treatments can be applied safely um, to colonies during the winter and can be eff effective and, and colonies can survive the winter um, with these treatments in place. So, um, you know, this is not following the label, um, but uh, just in general, um, the winter treatment window appears to be an opportunity for us based on our data so far. You know, we need to make sure that we have the right dose uh, of the product, um, but uh, but it can, they can be safe and effective treatments during the winter. Sweet. So, uh, I mean, it's probably for most beekeepers not practical to start for this winter anyway. So you're going to have by next fall, we'll have your results, mm -hmm. and we'll know something about. Um, what dosage and what timing would be optimum for a winter treatment. I've always felt the one thing that gives us Canadian beekeepers both the most trouble but also the most opportunity is this long winter when there's not much going on in these hives. Those mites are just sitting there waiting for us to get them if we can just figure out how to do that. And so I, I thank uh, you for your work to try to help us do that. Um, you lift a lot of boxes today. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel? Strong. Strong. He's a strong man. <laughs> I, he had to, I'll, I'll show some. There's so many bees, the photo is just too dark. <laughs> we had to tip all those boxes back because we were scoring these colonies. It's important to say, well, you know, if a hive is weak in the spring, was it weak? So all these colonies were scored at the onset of the trial, and then you scored them again now, and then we'll score them again in the spring. 
and we'll have a, not only a sense of you know, whether the hive lived or died, but whether it thrived or whether it didn't. And that'll help us narrow it down. So good job. Okay, good well, job. <laughs> good. It's a good worker. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day. And maybe just a couple oh, yeah, thank yeah, yous. Um, a thank you to First Vita B Health for providing the rock sand strips for this study. They, you know, are not funding the study or influencing us in any way, but they did provide free product for us to try, and so we appreciate that. Um, and then thanks to, to Phil for donating these colonies to research. Um, really applied practical research for beekeepers would not be possible without generous beekeepers like Phil who are willing to donate their colonies to science. I'm getting them back. I, uh, <laughs> I only lent you the call. It's true, but um, for two years in a row now, so that's um, a big contribution, so thank you for that. Very good. Thanks a lot. And also to Matthew from the Knowledge and Research Transfer Program uh, for all the help and all the staff and also, yes. Yeah, Matthew and his team have been awesome. Yes, and, Matthew. And um, Sir, he has also been pretty awesome <laughs> too, so thank you. Laura and Amanda for sure.